Okay, so this is a um, review of the polygyny threshold model. And a little bit later in the video, I will also review the pied flycatcher experiment where they were testing the male scarcity hypothesis. So those were two things that came up a lot on um, still confusing points from last week's Wednesday lecture. So I want to make sure that I review those. So beginning with the polygyny threshold model, I'm just going to kind of review everything and hope that I've covered all the bases of things that might have confused people. So this is a model that is used to predict the mate choice that females will make when they're um, in this very particular scenario where they can choose to mate with um, male A up here that's an already mated male, and that already mated male has a better, has a good quality territory. Or she can mate with this male at territory B, which is a lower quality territory, but the male is a bachelor. And so what we've talked about is um, there are there should be costs um, involved with being a second female or one of two females rather than being the only female, right? So you're going to get less resources, less parental care from a male, whatever it might be. Um, and so this model incorporates that by making the the fitness payoff for being um, the first female with a male um, as a function of his territory quality. That line is always above the fitness payoff of being the second female at a territory. Okay, so this model assumes that if you're the second female arriving um, and mating with a male, you're going to have lower fitness than if you're choosing than if you were to get there first. So that's the the difference between those lines is the cost of being the second female. And um, so what it takes into account is the difference between um, the the qualities of the two males' territories and sort of the difference in, in fitness um, of, of each choice. So for this. First example, we're imagining that this is kind of, we, if we quantify the territory quality, um, A is up here and B is lower quality. So if we look at where um, the females, the fit, fitness payoff to females for these two different choices, so remember B is a bachelor male, so if the female mates with B, she'll be the first monogamous female, so we're going to trace up to where we hit the red curve and then look over to where we hit the y-axis, so that's her fitness payoff. For male A, if we do the same thing, so if she chooses A, she's going to choose to be the second female there, so we're going to go up to the blue curve and then trace over, and you can see that that fitness payoff is actually higher than it would be for her to be monogamous with the male at territory B. Okay, so the polygyny threshold is this point here, so if we look at where if we trace over, so this is the fitness payoff for being the monogamous, being monogamous with male B. Um, the polygyny threshold is the place, the territory quality for which the fitness payoff of being the second female would be equivalent as being monogamous with the bachelor male. Okay, and so at this particular point, so if, if the male, if male A had been here, it would have been. Um, there, there wouldn't have been a difference um, dep in, depending on what she chose, right? So either choice would have been fine. So she's getting the same fitness payoff. However, as you go above this threshold, so as you get anywhere over here, if the already mated male has a much higher quality territory that exceeds this threshold, then the female should always choose to, to mate with the um, already mated male rather than the bachelor male. Okay, so that's the, the polygyny threshold, and because she's choosing polygyny over monogamy, we call it the polygyny threshold. So you can imagine that if instead of having the territory quality uh, way up here, if instead male um, A's territory was down here, so it's better than B, but just a little bit better, in that case, if we compare the two fitness payoffs, um, it's much worse for a female to choose to be polygynous with this male than it would be for her to be monogamous with B. Right, so if you look at the payoffs, so and you can see here that this particular point on the x-axis doesn't exceed that polygyny threshold. So in this case, she should not choose polygyny. She should choose to be the monogamous with um, male B. So what we can do with that, and what I had to do in class, is to imagine a scenario where you have um, males with different quality territories. Sorry about that. Um, males with different quality territories, and you can actually... Um, predict where females will settle if you imagine that there's females arriving sequentially in a habitat. And so um, in this particular example, uh, male, the, the male that's on territory A 
has the highest quality territory, and then it goes down, and the male on territory F has the lowest quality territory. So the first female that arrives on the scene, if these are all unmated males, should choose male A because he has the best quality territory, right? So that's pretty um, straightforward. The second female, so now she can, the second female can choose to be the second polygynous female with A, or she can choose to be an, um, the first female to mate with B. And because the fitness payoff of being the first female with B is higher than it would be to be the second female with A, so the difference there, she should choose to be with B, right? So, and we're going to put her here so we remember that we've got a female with B. That's her fitness payoff here, if we trace over. Um, so the third female is where things get kind of interesting, right? So the third female could choose to be monogamous with C, or she could choose to be the second polygynous female with male A. And you can see here that we've had a big jump in territory quality, where we've, we've got a pretty big difference between C and both A and B. So in this case, the polygyny threshold is somewhere around here, right? So this is where um, the fitness should be equal between um, these, the, the choices between an already mated male and an unmated male with C. And so you can see that A is pretty far above that. Right? So the difference in quality is so great that it exceeds that polygyny threshold. So the third female should um, choose to mate with A. And, um, oh, sorry, I forgot to animate that. And the same is going to be true for the fourth female, right? So she could be the, the first female, the monogamous female that mates with C, or the second one for B. And it's going to be a better choice for her because the fitness payoff is higher to be the second polygynous female with male B. All right, so once... There are two females with both of those males that have the higher quality territories. Those males are, are no longer available to mate, right? So this model only um, accounts for a maximum of two females per male. So you can imagine that you can make this more complicated and add in some other curves, but we only have two curves here. So we're only, we're maxing out at, at um, two females. So when we think about the fifth female, she should come down here and be the first female to mate with C, right? So all we have left are males C through F, and male C has the highest quality territory of those, so she should mate with him. And then male 6 should go and be the monogamous female with D. Even though I haven't drawn it in, you can see that if she were to choose to be the second um, polygynous female with C, her fitness would be down here, which is quite a bit lower, so the sixth female would do best to be with male D. Okay. So those are the kinds of predictions that that model can make. Um, so hopefully that helped to clear up a few things for people. And I'm going to move on now to talk about the experiment that I uh, t told you about with pied flycatchers. So, um, so this species is pretty interesting because, um, at least for the um, red-winged blackbirds that we talked about, males are usually in close, um, close proximity to other males, and so females are seeing multiple males at once and um, judging them based on their territories. In the pied flycatcher, um, males often have their nests um, really far apart. So a, a single female might have a, um, a nest where he's mated with a female, and then he can actually go and really far away establish, so 100 or more meters away, establish a second nest and try to attract a female at that nest. And we've already talked about the fact that um, being a second female for a single male should impose costs for females. So the question is, why do females choose those males? Assuming that there's a cost in doing that. So the polygyny threshold model, if it's operating, um, might make this prediction if there's a difference in territory qualities between males and the already mated males have superior territories, right? And, and that exceeds that threshold of where it actually makes sense for the female's fitness payoff to choose an already mated male. So that would be the, um, so that's if she's judging males based on their territories. There's also a second hypothesis that they considered, which is that um, given that these nests are so far apart from one another, well, a single male has nests that are really spread out, it could be that when a female sees a male at this empty nest where he's trying to attract her, she doesn't even know about the, the nest that he's already established with a second female far away. Right, so in this case, this hypothesis states that females are making this choice because males are deceiving them. So they're being deceived. They don't actually realize that they're mating with an already mated male. And they also considered a third hypothesis, which is that um, it could be that, that females 
um, understand what they're doing. They, they know the males have a second female far away, but if unmated males are relatively scarce in that area, then if all that's available are these already mated males, then that might explain why a female would choose that kind of male. Right? So it's better to choose a male and, and mate rather than choosing nothing at all. So the first and the third hypotheses acknowledge that females are um, know about the other um, mating, so they know he's already mated, and they're making a choice. So the first one says that she's making that choice based on territory quality. The male scarcity hypothesis says she's making that choice because there's no other options available. And it's just the second hypothesis that hypothesizes that females don't actually realize that the males are already mated. Okay, so that's the difference between the hypotheses. So the way that they set up their experiment, they um, were really interested in, in the second and third hypotheses here. So they wanted to distinguish between those two. So the way they set up their experiment, they um, had an um, two nest boxes that were empty um, in relatively close proximity to one another. So they were a pair that females could choose between. One of them belonged to a male who had already mated and had a nest box with another female um, 100 to 300 meters away. And so even though this, this um, nest box was empty, he was already mated with another female. The other nest box had a truly unmated male. So this male had no other females. And so um, they had replicates of these pairings that um, females coming into the area could make a choice between. Okay, and so over um, the period of the kind of mating season, they recorded which male females chose. And so if the male scarcity hypothesis is correct, and, and that's what's um, determining why females are making this choice, we're now creating this artificial scenario where unmated males are available, right? So in this particular situation, unmated males are not scarce. And so if that's the only thing that's causing females to mate with these already mated males, then we would expect females to not choose those mated males, right? Because we've removed that, um, the problem of male scarcity. And so, so we would expect females to choose the unmated males. Right, so th this hypothesis um, states that females know that males already mated, so she should choose the better option. The other hypothesis, the deception hypothesis, would hypothesize that she can't tell the difference between these males, right? So they both look like unmated males, so um, there'd be no uh, direction that we would predict females to choose more than the other, right? So that she'd be equally likely to choose either of these, all else being equal. Okay, so if we look at their data, what we actually see, or what they actually saw, was that for the unmated males, um, about half the time females chose them. So 9 out of 20 times females chose the unmated males, 11 out of 20 times they chose the mated males. So it's not perfectly half and half, but females were basically equally likely to choose um, either type of male, which is much more consistent with the um, deception hypothesis rather than the male scarcity hypothesis, right? So if females can tell that this male is mated, they wouldn't be choosing to mate with them half the time. So I hope that that helped a little bit, but um, if there are any remaining questions about that, also um, please feel free to bring those to class um, tomorrow. Okay, thanks.